All right, so continuing on with this little uh, Liasis series here. First we did the Australian Olive Python, uh, and then I followed up with the Papuan Olive Python, even though it's not technically in the Liasis genus. I just thought it was necessary to do those two together. Uh, today I'm going to show you guys the Maclot Python, uh, which is another you know, tropical Indo-Australian python, primarily found throughout the Lesser Sunda Island. Uh, this is likely the most common uh, of the Liasis genus. And really the most underrated in my opinion, like they have kind of a bad reputation for being aggressive. I think a lot of it has to do with a number of things. 95% uh, of these things uh, are basically wild caught, sub adult. Uh, the next is babies. Babies of the whole genus, um, but pythons in general, other than ball pythons, these babies can be really aggressive at first uh, until you know they hit like a year old and then they just naturally start to mellow out a bit. Um, and then the other thing is I find it's the way that people interact with them. So any ones that I've ever gotten that have been aggressive after a few months of me having them are not. Like this is another animal that was really aggressive, apparently. Uh, after a few months, like I don't tame them or work with them really. But after they kind of realize, you know, how you deal with them, they seem to be pretty mellow. Uh, the problem is people see them get upset and striking and they get close to the cage and oh look it's upset uh, and they don't allow them to calm down right they just stay defensive so these guys are never disturbed you know other than me being down here and in turn they're calm uh, they're probably also the cheapest of the genus like you get a Maclot python I sell captive bred babies for 200 bucks just because that reputation they have uh, not everybody wants to work with them, but when you know about them, they're honestly a super interesting snake. Like, like all of them, really iridescent, real smooth scaled. They get a good size. This is kind of like your average size adult. Uh, I have one, and I've seen like three males that are well over nine foot, probably pushing at least ten foot. Uh, but on average six to eight foot I would say for these guys. Which is funny because I've never actually seen a female that big. Whereas all my breeder males for the most part though are small. Uh, so I think it's just because I grow them that way. But real easy, typical care. Like I keep them the same as I keep most of my stuff. PVC cages. Uh, I never really kept the basking spot as warm as I did say the olive pythons but or the Australian olive pythons. When I was using heat tape, I would set the basking spot to 88. And then my room always sits during the day, 80 to 82 degrees. At nighttime in the summer, it'll drop to 78. In the winter, it'll drop to around 70 Fahrenheit, obviously. Whereas now that everything's you know primarily basking lights, directly under that basking light midday, uh, the surface could hit 95 degrees. Um, which I don't care because it's a large enclosure, right? If it was a rack or something, I wouldn't do that. But they've got the gradient, they've got the space to get away from it. And I'll see them all the time go over to a 95 degree basking spot under a light and coil up there for, God, better part of an hour, uh, and then go hide out for the rest of the day. It's funny because I see since I've done the basking lights in the morning, you see more of a routine, they'll go coil up under the lights. I've got pictures of a wall where every species in the genus were all coiled up under the basking lights, which is kind of cool. But yeah, I give them, you know, typical water dishes. They can fit in them. Uh, my mac lots really only ever soak if they're deep in shed. Uh, humidity in the room. In my room, the humidity stays between 50 and 64 percent on average but I go through and I soak down the coconut husk bedding once a week and then the humidity in the cages is usually 60 70 percent something like that they got pretty good airflow like I said they're big cages too the thing I like about the max is they usually have a really nice gold chin 
and they're quite variable in pattern too. This one's kind of in between, but some of them have like a olivey wash over the base color and in the speckles as well. Whereas I have some babies that I've held back that are almost like solid black just with a gold head uh, and then some light silver speckles. So whether that's, you know, the fact maybe I'm breeding two different localities together because I don't have any locality information on my animals, um, or whether it's just individual, like, natural variants, like, you know, look at Colombian boas, right? You'll get siblings. One will be solid, no speckles. You'll get another one that's heavily speckled. Could be the same thing with these. Um, but I'm going to breed them, see uh, if I can selectively breed for some cool stuff. As far as breeding goes, these guys are really easy to breed. Um, like I said, I got the basking lights, so in the winter all I do is the lights get shut off like two, three hours earlier than I would in the summer. So in turn, the temperature starts dropping a little sooner. I shut off the room heat at night, so the temps will drop down to on average around 70 degrees. You know, some nights are a little warmer, some nights are a little cooler. And then all the temps go back up pretty much the same during the day. The only difference is in the winter, they'll get more extreme night drops. Whereas in the summertime, during the day, sometimes the building will get hot. So we'll get like extreme daytime highs where it'll hit maybe 85 degrees or something. Uh, it pretty much just reverses in the winter. Uh, I throw the mail in there. Uh, usually in November, I throw the males in. And with the max, I never really often see too much copulation. Like they usually go into the hide. They'll stay in the hide with each other for a couple months. And then I'll see the male all of a sudden will be hiding on the opposite end of the cage. He won't be sitting with the female anymore. I pull the male. Uh, and then on average, I'll get anywhere from 16 to 20 eggs uh, from females this size. What I've kind of been doing is I've got holdbacks from separate wild caught pairs so then i produce captive bred unrelated pairs that i'll raise up and then i'll use those as my future breeders but they're easy going easy to breed uh, i've never had one get sick that i can recall they shed well as long as you've got decent humidity typical lyasis feeding response too uh, food comes in they don't play they smash it and then I'll feed my babies. I feed like all my babies for the most part once a week, uh, like a hopper, adult mouse, and uh, get like a Steve Irwin neck bite here. Uh, <laughs> and then as they grow, like these adults, I'll feed them every two to three weeks, just depending time of year, sex, and the size of the prey I'm feeding them. But you want them to be—they're not supposed to be a thick snake. Uh, you want them to be a lean, rock solid, muscular snake, which you can see like, you know, this is a really solid animal. They're pretty active, like you could keep them in an arboreal setup. I wouldn't completely sacrifice floor space for climbing, um, but if you give them branches or shelves, they'll hang out on them fairly often. I find, well, it depends on the individual. Some of mine are out lots during the day, um, whereas some, like this one in particular, come in at nighttime and she's all over the place, but during the day she's usually in her hive. But yeah, super easy snake. Like I said, super underrated. Like, people just don't understand. They hear all this stuff about them, about how aggressive they are, hard to work with. Um, which I've not found that to be the case, except for in babies. The babies can be a real bugger at first, but they're well worth it if you grow them up. Because it's just, you know, other than this group of pythons, like when you get a snake that looks like that, total iridescent sheen, they're like velvet. Got a little olive python in the back there, you can see. And then, yeah, pink tongue on them.
And then, yeah, this female is probably, if I were to guess, uh, seven feet. And that's really typical size. And then you can see, like, pretty much all the lyasses. They got a few heat pits on the lower jaw there. And then a few right up on the front of the face as well. But yeah, super underrated. Like, I wouldn't listen to the, the stereotype that they have about being aggressive because if you get a bigger one and you, like, treat it respectfully I find that they're no problem like I had 12 adult math clocks at one point when I was a teenager and uh, they were all pretty good they weren't all good when I first got them but just respectfully handling them uh, not stressing them out makes a world of difference and then the babies too like my holdbacks yeah they're they're real nasty for the first year but if you handle them you know here and there even, uh, they mellow out a fair bit. And like I said, just don't stress them out. Don't get hyped up when they start striking at you. Uh, and they'll usually calm down. But real strong. You know, she's got a good grip at the tail. And yeah, as far as, uh, you know, incubation, like I said, I usually get 16 and 20 eggs. These guys don't take nearly as long to incubate as the olive pythons. Uh, the olive pythons for me have been the longest in the genus. Uh, these guys are pretty typical. Two month incubation at 88 degrees. I incubate them. I use either vermiculite or perlite with uh, that lighting diffuser on top. Just something to separate it from the substrate. And then I can completely saturate the substrate. Uh, it's in like a shoebox size tote. I pop the lid on, there's one air hole in it. Uh, and then yeah, in two months I get pretty much 100% hatch rate. The babies of these guys I found to be probably the easiest to get feeding out of the genus. Uh, almost first try, all of them usually take frozen thawed. I'll start them on frozen thawed pinkies or fuzzies, depending on like the size of the ones that I have. And they grow pretty quick, so within a couple months they're on hoppers and they're uh, smooth sailing from there. But yeah, just like beautiful snake. And sure, you don't get the morphs and all of that, but that's kind of the cool thing is like, you don't even need the morphs. There's so much variance between the individual babies, uh, in my experience anyways, that it's just as cool and it's less predictable, right? Like you don't know what you're gonna get. And I'm gonna try and do some line breeding like with the babies I held back that are almost solid black just with a gold head. That's kind of what I've been keeping babies back to look like. So we'll see once I breed them if it, you know, if you can kind of line breed them for a specific look or not. But probably the most underrated snake. Uh, like this is awesome. It's a big snake. 